is why is our world the way it is? And there are of course multiple reasons for that. So some of them going back uh, far in time. The most obvious reason is of course this. Uh, if the dinosaurs had been wiped out about 65 to 61 million years ago, we would not be sitting here. And there are even more profound reasons for why the world the way it is. It is the way it is having to do with cosmology and so on. Now I'm not going to bore you with this. I'm going to go straight to what I'm going to talk about, which is, as Steve already indicated, the world is the way it is, and has been for the last couple of centuries, uh, because the Roman Empire fell and then came back. At least that, in a nutshell, is the thesis of my talk. Now, taking you back in time, about 61 million years, about 1800 years, this is uh, the way the world looked like uh, at around the time of Christ, or about three quarters uh, of all people who lived on Earth at the time were under the control of this nominally of a very small number of empires. The Roman Empire uh, in the West, and the Han Empire in the East, and we have a few Iranian Indian empires in between. And there's no obvious reason why the world today should be organized in a different way. Because if you fast forward, these empires fall apart uh, every so often, but they tend to be reconstituted, certainly in the case of China, and also with some frequency in India, and certainly in the Middle East, and even in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, but not in Europe. So there has to be a reason for that. This is a very, very simple model of what it's a really simple model, as you can see. It captures what is it, 3,000 years of uh, history in Eastern and Western Eurasia. And it talks about, it tries to show, it's a model of uh, how um, states are organized, or how similar or different um, state formation was in Western Eurasia, by which I mean Europe and the Mediterranean and East Asia, what we would consider the core, the Eastern uh, part of China. And the argument in a nutshell is that you start out uh, with quite um, diverse uh, political regimes that become more similar uh, over time in terms of scale, in terms of scheme of internal organization. And then around the 6th century AD or so, there's a reflection point. And from that point onwards, up in the quite recent past, not necessarily the present, but in the very recent past, uh, political, macro political development diverges in a meaningful way. Now, going back in time about uh, 3,000 years, what you have in both cases, in the Mediterranean and in uh, East Asia, is intense fragmentation. There are hundreds of polities, as far as we know, in the earlier uh, spring and autumn period that gradually coalesce into an ever small number of ever larger kingdoms. You have um, the same situation, of course, famously, in the Mediterranean, where the Greeks established over 1,000 uh, city-states, the other people who same in Italy or the Phoenicians uh, in North Africa, and political fragmentation could not get any more intense. In those areas where there are no city states, we have what used to be called in less GC times some tribes or chieftains, again, small scale forms of organization. And what happens in both cases is, uh, I think I have to go back one, if you can do that. No, no. Uh, what happens in both cases is uh, a process of, uh, as I said, coalescing driven by demographic and economic development. We end up with about half a dozen uh, sizable states. The Hellenistic successive states of Alexander or the Persian Empire in the East, uh, the Roman alliance in uh, short wars, and the uh, Phoenician and Carthaginians uh, in the South. And it's essentially a system of boring states, of states that are engaging, intensifying interstate competition for quite an extended period. And uh, the same, oh, it's the shifting arrow thing. What is the word that way? Yeah, it's never. Okay, can you go back to that? Yay! Okay. So the same uh, happens, of course, in China. That's where you have the famous warring states. We eventually end up with seven kingdoms that engage in long-term competition, a very bloody uh, interstate competition, you know, in a, roughly at the same time. In fact, that's a coincidence in the 5th, 4th, and 3rd centuries AD. Eventually, in both cases, in go to four, please, um, you get uh, a situation where one of these uh, warring states knocks out all the others and conquers them, establishing uh, for the first time something like the universal empire in that particular Space. It's the empire of the first emperor, the Terracotta Army guy, which is soon replaced with the Han Empire. It's around for more than 400 years, 
uh, that covers a big chunk of the China is today. And then, of course, in the West, you have, uh, again, at the same time, the development of uh, the Roman Empire. Now, I should say, just, uh, in, this is a slightly shorter version of my talk. I could go on about this at some length, but I don't want to. It's not, this is a case of parallel development. But if you um, remember when all the arrows are actually converging for the first 1,500 years or so, and I showed them as, as converging because internally the political institutions become more similar over time. Uh, you have autocracy early on. Uh, in China, of course, you have Republican regimes among the Greeks, especially among the Romans. Uh, so initially, the starting conditions are quite similar, but both, both environments end up with these monarchy, uh, centralized empires, and growth of bureaucracy uh, eventually also evolve, a uh, retreat in the way of bureaucracy in China. They become more and more similar uh, over time. It will take a separate talk just to flesh out this particular statement. So you just have to take a word for it. This is what actually happens. Now, eventually, both of these empires um, fall apart. Uh, they fall apart in a very distinctive way. Again, it's a case of parallel development, where the more exposed half of each empire is taken over by quote unquote barbarians, by marginal uh, groups of the old frontiers who infiltrate and or invade uh, this more exposed half. In the case of the Romans, the more exposed half uh, ultimately is the western half of the empire, with the Germans coming in and setting up these sub Roman um, successor kingdoms that initially rely very heavily on Roman style institutions. In China, of course, it's the northern half uh, of the country that's more exposed because of the steppe formations out in Mongolia and Nigeria uh, and Central Asia. Uh, this is actually impossible to depict because there's a, a period, a period of disunion for a quarter of a millennium. We have contained some political fragmentation in the northern half of China, where all these rival state groups come in, set up very ephemeral states. Uh, and so the situation lasts for a long time. So it's not entirely dissimilar from what happens in uh, Europe in the post-Roman period. So far, um, so good. But eventually, of course, you end up with divergence. How does divergence happen? Well, again, initially, it seems that in both parts of the old world, similar processes are about to unfold. In both cases, um, what is left of imperial structures uh, tries to restore uh, a state on the same scale as the preceding empires, the Medieval Roman Empire, uh, in the West, the Han Empire, in the East. Now, in the West, this is, of course, done by the East Roman and Byzantine uh, Empire, which uh, survives intact the so-called fall of the Roman Empire in the West, and in the 6th century, uh, rulers, uh, one ruler anyway, in the East goes out um, and um, tries to retake uh, lots of territories. Uh, in what used to be the western core of the empire, they were one forward. They are reasonably successful in retaking at least the coastal uh, area. It's not a war that was trying to break them, but the Mediterranean basin is once again, uh, it seems, under control of the Romans. And this process could arguably have continued had not other factors intervened, uh, especially, of course, the rise of um, what, what is like initially when Arabs coming out of the peninsula, taking over what was left. Much of what was left of the Roman Empire and the uh, Sassanian Iranian Empire for the East. Now, if you just look at this, you could say, okay, this is the same kind of empire. It's under new, under new leadership. They no longer call themselves Romans, they are Arabs, but they rely on the same institutions of government. It's simply a continuation, not an iteration of a very large empire in this particular part of the world. But again, for reasons I can't really go into, uh, this empire, although it looks very impressive uh, on, on, on a slide, uh, covers a lot of orange space, is very uh, segmented uh, internally already from the beginning, having to do with Arabic social structure in a number of reasons, uh, regionalization of the military, and so within a reasonably short amount of time, you get increasing fission until about, about 1000 AD. Well, they're still a caliphate, uh, but it exists mostly uh, in name, and you have a number of uh, Arab run uh, Islamic successor states that carve up. Of this particular sphere. There are periods of reconcentration in the Ottomans, but you never get anything like the original uh, Umayyad Empire. Later on, let alone anything like the Roman Empire. Now, this is very different from what happens in China. What happens in China is that eventually uh, the people in the north uh, get their act together, uh, they rebuild a strong centralized state in the 5th and 6th uh, centuries uh, AD, which then goes out. Uh, conquers the southern half of China and ends up by the end of the 6th century with essentially a, a unified, uh, even improved version of the Han Empire, the Sui Dynasty, which then 
uh, the Khan had controlled essentially uh, the same space geographically as the Han Empire had done at its peak. Uh, next one, please. Well, this, of course, is uh, famously only one episode in a whole series of iterations where these empires that are associated with specific dynasties uh, last for a certain amount of time, a couple centuries, usually on average. There's some period of collapse, internal fragmentation, foreign takeover. The mechanism varies, but uh, the empires always put together again. It's not just always put together again. The periods, the intervals in between those uh, imperial formations become shorter and shorter over time. But there's a clear trend towards the civilization uh, of China in the uh, let's see, uh, the Tang, the Song, the Mongol dynasties, the, Man the Amin dynasty, the Manchu dynasty, and in a sense, the People's Republic of China, at least in terms of geographical coverage, is a continuation of the latest iteration in this uh, particular process. Now, this, of course, is very different from what happens in Europe. What happens in Europe is you have tons of people running around claiming to be refounding uh, the Roman uh, Empire, as famous as Charlemagne, uh, the pink area here. You know, the pink area looks pretty impressive. Uh, internally, uh, his resources are the, the means at his disposal are nothing like of what the Romans have commanded centuries earlier. It's a bit of a paper tiger, and it soon uh, disintegrates among his heirs. And then, of course, Europe enters this prolonged period uh, of internal fragmentation, which is actually impossible to capture on a map like this. Because even though you can grow all these kingdoms, internally the kingdoms are really very much segmented among uh, the nobility, lords and their castles, um, bishops, uh, autonomous or free city-states, uh, any number of overlapping uh, sovereignties, uh, competing qualities that operate under the umbrella of these uh, weak feudal states, uh, which of course is especially true of the Holy Roman Empire of German nation, which is not Roman, it's not Holy, it's not even Empire. It doesn't really have what the purpose of capabilities. I like this map very much because it really makes a, a spirited attempt to capture some of the internal fragmentation of those states. So even though you may see large kingdoms on the map internally, uh, they're very, very different. And it takes the European states a very long time in the Roman period, again driven by economic and demographic development, to get their act together, to reassert our central government authority, uh, and then in the process of ongoing interstate warfare, just as in the warring states really, in China antiquity, uh, to rebuild uh, a system of competing uh, states that uh, by and large eventually uh, retain their sovereignty. So, of course, then eventually we end up with the, the map we have today, the Europe of the nation states, the nation states growing out uh, in many cases of these sub Roman or uh, medieval kingdoms. There is never again an empire that controls. When empire returns to Europe, it doesn't actually, well, it returns to Europeans, but not in Europe, it's exported into an increasingly uh, large global peripheries where uh, Europeans set up uh, empire, take over existing empires, uh, in some cases, in the new world, culminating, starting with the Spanish, and of course, culminating uh, with the uh, famous British Empire. When attempts are finally made to re-establish something on the scale of the Roman Empire in Europe itself, these attempts are late and are spectacularly uh, unsuccessful. Um, they are attempted essentially twice uh, by Napoleon and then more uh, ambitiously by Hitler, and we know how these cases ended. The very short version of why uh, these particular attempts uh, failed is really uh, basically two reasons. Uh, if you have just a system uh, of competing states on a Europe-wide scale, you know, it's possible that one state gets a leg up because of some institutional improvements, nationalization, education, demography, uh, you name it. However, once you have external resources that are brought to bear on this conflict, it becomes virtually impossible for this one state to really successfully uh, dominate or conquer all the others. In this case, you have the two outliers. You have Britain, which is an island very conveniently and increasingly controls uh, a global empire. And you have Russia uh, to the east, which has enormous depth as both Napoleon and Hitler are discovered to be Of course, these factors are even more important in World War II, but they are already present, of course, at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. In this configuration, I put it to factor in the European options in the United States in World War II. It makes the case of the uh, Axis powers uh, even more hopeless. Now here it is, I think, quite instructive uh, to emphasize the systematic contrast with what happens in China. Because those two elements are really um, missing from Chinese history. 
there are no comparable powers at the margins of the state system uh, in, uh, in Eastern China that would ex ex exert a similar kind of influence. So if you want to have a counterfactual, we thought about this last night, if you want to have a counterfactual to turn this space into something more like modern Europe, it would require Japan to be like Britain. Japan would have had to be the most developed country already by thousands of years ago out there, which was manifestly uh, not the case, and would then intervene forcefully in the mainland, which does not happen to the late 19th century when Japan industrializes and uh, mainland China doesn't yet. And you would need the equivalent of Russia. And the equivalent of Russia in this case would probably be some state empire that has the same kind of uh, spatial depth and would become involved in conflicts. And you never get this kind of configuration. So it's very, it's much easier for parties within the core area of China uh, to uh, assert or reassert dominance over this, uh, over this particular geographical area. Uh, right, so this is an attempt to uh, quantify and to visualize what I've just talked about. Because people, this is not what I've said surprise the very original, people always say, well, you know, there was uh, iteration of empires in China and not in cultural in Europe. But I think it's really instructive to try and put numbers on this. So what this graph does is it looks at 1900 years of state power in Eastern and Western Eurasia. Now, the red line uh, shows the percentage of people who live in the area originally controlled by the Romans at any point in time, who are under the control of the biggest state in that particular space. So as long as the Roman Empire exists, it controls 100% of all people who live within the confines of the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire goes away, there are successor states, and no successor state of the you live on the uh, ever controls more than about 20-25% of the people who live in the space formerly occupied by the Roman Empire. Initially it's France, and later on uh, it's Russia. You can do the same exercise as the blue line for Europe. You measure what percentage of Europeans, geographically defined, are under the control of the biggest power in that space. And the Romans control 85-90% of all Europeans. It's not of European space, but Europe outside the Roman Empire is put in uh, by comparison. When the Roman Empire goes away, when they have a brief blip, as you can see on the Charlemagne, but it is the same situation. No one power, initially it's our friends and then it's the Ottoman Empire, controls more than 20% of all people who live. Uh, I should put it the wrong way around. The Ottoman Empire becomes the biggest group in the Roman Empire, and Russia becomes uh, the biggest power in uh, Europe. But these biggest powers, these biggest powers never control more than about 20% of the population. I think it's important to look at population because area, we just look at space, the Mongols have a most amazing state ever, and they did, they just control a lot of it. So it's easy work to look at uh, the underlying demography. Now if you compare this to China, you've got a very different kind of development. We can track this because we have census figures going back to the year 2 AD, uh, telling us about the uh, size of the population under control of the physical control of uh, the Chinese state. And I talk about core area, core China, leave out Tibet and a few other peripheral areas, which I'd say I'm not really part of China, not allowed to say that. And you can see uh, wild up and down swings. Whenever you have um, a mature empire, a particular dynasty, uh, it tends to control close to the 100% uh, of people in that particular space. And you have the intervals of fragmentation in between. We have multiple competing states in this area, and then they're replaced by new iteration of universal empire. So the very simplified version is this over 2,000 years. Uh, if you have uh, initially in the West, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, you have no Rome and uh, no Rome. And once you are in a no Rome phase, you have uh, 1,500 years of polycentrism and fragmentation. In the Chinese case, uh, you have these oscillations over time with periodic uh, recreation of empire. Now, this is, of course, one of the two questions to be addressed. Why did things turn out in this particular way? The second question is, why does this matter? Which is a more interesting question, because why am I talking about this, right? But we have to uh, look at this first, at least for a little bit. Uh, there are any number of causes that have been invoked uh, to make sense of this particular development. And some are actually surprisingly specific. Uh, I call them proximate causes because they are sort of on the surface of the level of institutions rather than uh, regarding more fundamental forces such as ecology, geography, and so on. 
What's interesting is uh, when the, uh, the Roman Empire in the West falls apart, it doesn't fall apart, it's taken over by Germans. And the one thing is the Germans do very poorly is to count and tax people. When they take over the rest of the Roman Empire, they decide it's too much work to count and tax people all the time. It's true, it is a lot of work. Uh, they just you know, seize land and give it out to the followers of the king, which is a very economical measure early on. The problem is if you do this consistently, you end up with a state, a king, that doesn't really have any power. If you don't get to pay people's salaries, well, why would they follow you? If you hand over land to them, you control the land to surplus directly, what's the incentive in uh, being bossed around by a particular king? In order to persuade people to follow him, the king has to give more and more land to the, uh, the feudal lords and so on. Until by about 1000 AD, you end up with a situation where you have a French king. Is a king really in name only? He doesn't have uh, very much real power at least compared uh, to other more established uh, monarchies. Whereas in China, when the, the steppe people come in, in this period of this union, in the 3rd, 4th, 5th uh, century AD, they are very keen on continuing ex existing practices of taxation. They don't want to have land, because they're not the homeless. They want to be a new ruling class of this huge territory of this population which has conquered. And uh, they have a strong incentive in getting people to continue those fiscal institutions. That's important. Because if states don't have fiscal abilities, the ability to count and tax people systematically, they are never going to get their act together. They will never be able to have really big armies. They won't be able to go out and create uh, these huge empires. So that's arguably quite a significant difference. Uh, if you look at European history, it takes those states, the European kingdoms, hundreds of years to get to anything like the tax system that the Romans had put in place uh, much earlier, which had essentially completely disappeared in this part of the world, whereas you have a lot of continuity in the case of China. Uh, then, of course, there are what I call ultimate uh, causes to do with the underlying cultural or ecological geographical conditions. And I'm going to start with ideology, uh, cultural factors, not because I think they're necessarily decisive or particularly important, but because they're always both time. You probably have uh, some weight. Now, this compares systematically certain features of uh, ancient early Chinese imperial culture and uh, Roman cultural uh, conditions. So we have from early on, uh, early China is of course very diverse. Uh, early on. You can't imagine this really as a single uh, ethnic group, but even so superimposed on this, you have a literate elite that uses the same writing system, uh, the same elite version uh, of the language, which is of course never the case in the Roman Empire. Roman Empire is at the elite level, it's bilingual, in the Latin in the West, uh, and Greek in the East. There are very strong parochial languages, Aramaic in particular, uh, probably lots of still Celtic speakers, maybe Punic speakers. Uh, in North Africa, there's a great deal of diversity. In Chinese political thought, it's fair to say you only have a single model of how a state should be organized, which is monarchy. You can debate about what the, what the monarch should be like, if it should be nice to his people, less nice than the various uh, 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 strands of thought in our political discourse, but the fact that we should have a monarchical system is never really in doubt. There's no real alternative conception to that. Of course, in the West, you have a long tradition going back to the Greek polis, which is maintained quite actively under the Roman Empire of having autonomous uh, city states, uh, even of republican uh, forms of government. You have the centralization model that becomes more like China, that becomes more prominent. Uh, under uh, uh, the Roman monarchy, you have other models where you bring in foreigners and you settle them, which is how these uh, Germanic kingdoms start out uh, initially. So again, there's a more diversity in terms of approaches, in terms of political ideology of how a state might be organized. In China, famously, there is a strong concept, at least at the elite level. Ordinary people probably don't care about this very much, but at the elite level, there's a strong notion of indivisible legitimacy. You can't really have more than one. Uh, you can, of course, you have multiple people uh, claiming to be that, but it never quite uh, catches on. Again, this is very different uh, from what you have in Europe. Yes, there are people in Europe, Charlemagne, the Ottonians, who claim to be very interested in restoring the Roman Empire, but it's really sort of window dressing. And it's not as if European elites sit around all day and yearn for the good old days of the Roman Empire. Some lip services being paid, but it's not nearly as important to them. And that makes perfect sense, because again, uh, playing the functionalist, 
they don't depend on empire as much as the literary elites do in China. And literary elites, uh, China literary elites depend on the strong centralized state because it gives them jobs, it uh, gives them offices, which uh, makes them feel important, which enables them to extort uh, rents from the, the dominated uh, population. So really their livelihood, their status depends very much on the integrity of the state. And the bigger the more powerful the state is, the better it is. Uh, for more benefits accrued to that particular group. Well, in medieval Europe, as I said earlier, well, it doesn't really matter all that much if you have a king or not, if you control uh, your own territory, the guys that you know these guys in their castles, um, they are not super interested uh, in uh, having a, a strong empire, nor is the church. The church very much enjoys having the autonomy it has in Western Europe, a great autonomy, certainly compared to what goes on in the remnants of the Roman Empire out in Byzantium, where the uh, church is increasingly under the thumb of the, uh, uh, the, the monarchy and the sake of authorities. Now, China, of course, again, I'm talking about the Chinese elite, is governed by some kind of hybrid form from the Han period onwards uh, of a Confucian legalist uh, belief system, the idea being that elite identity is really rooted in a particular type of service for the state in acquisition of a particular package. Uh, of elite culture, and that tends to survive quite well, uh, judging by um, uh, the evidence we have, uh, even the examination system, right, where people have to sit exams and be considered for state office. Even this, amazingly, seems to survive uh, these periods of disunion. So you have state breakdown, but underneath uh, these uh, intellectual infrastructures survive and prove to be very resilient. And again, it is conducive at this level to uh, restoration of uh, central rule. Of course, in the West, as I already mentioned, um, ideological power uh, becomes uh, much more um, uh, dispersed in a way that the church in particular has no particular interest uh, in a strong state and it's a conflict between secular rulers and other uh, church leadership. Something slightly similar begins to happen in China in the period of this union, where you have Buddhism coming from India, going back to the first century AD. Buddhism becomes very, very popular in this interstitial period between the Han and the Tang. Developments are uh, actually quite similar to what you have in Europe. The Buddhist uh, monasteries that uh, accrue enormous wealth, ex enjoy all kinds of privileges, extension from taxation, and so on, drawing millions of followers. So they begin to provide a counterweight to the established Confucian elite and the states uh, they have in mind. But unlike in Europe, uh, the empire strikes back in this case. And there are massive body crackdowns on these Buddhist institutions, on the monasteries, in the run up to the restoration of the empire. Because the secular authorities correctly identify them as roadblocks, as obstacles to uh, uh, the recreation of a powerful state. And I could continue the list. Uh, there are other uh, issues such as the rise of Islam, which arguably creates two separate domains of beliefs within the space formerly occupied by the Roman Empire. I don't think that's very important early on because it takes a long time for populations under Arab rule to really uh, majority convert to Islam. That's a process that's been stretched out over hundreds of years. So initially, that's not very important. In the long run, it is arguably quite uh, important. I'm sure you can continue uh, this list anyway you like. Uh, the sum total is that whichever aspect you look at, uh, unify uh, 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 ideology, uh, ideology belief systems that are more conducive to having uh, the universal empire are simply much more developed uh, and more powerful in East Asia and China than in the area once occupied by the Roman Empire. So if you believe in the power of ideas, you might look at the slide and conclude there are very compelling reasons for why it was more difficult for people in the West to put the Roman Empire back together again. Of course, if you are more interested in uh, geography or ecology, well, you might come to the same conclusion because there are very significant differences between those two parts uh, of the old world. Uh, China has a natural core. Natural core uh, is this uh, great uh, plain here, which up to the early second millennium at least holds the overwhelming majority of all the people in China. The southern half of China is only gradually colonized and more densely settled over the course of mostly uh, of the second millennium AD. Whoever controls this plain where our population is uh, clustered together and fairly easy to control and to uh, exploit, you can mobilize large infantry armies. Whoever controls this area automatically dominates the entire uh, area shown on this map and you know, automatically dominates 
of uh, East Asia, and this is how these empires are uh, periodically restored. You seize control of this area, of the resources of the population, and that's the foundation for imperial uh, rule. The situation, of course, uh, in the uh, West is famously different. There is no terrestrial core. There's the Mediterranean. Mediterranean is a wonderful core if you are already in possession of all its coastal areas. That is perfect, right? Because it's much cheaper, much faster to move goods and people uh, by sea than over land. The challenge is to unify this very elongated space in the first place. And that only happens once in world history, or at least once before World War II, I guess. Uh, effectively, the Western Allies have been in control of uh, the same space. It's a very long period. Uh, of fragmentation, most famously, of course, eventually between the Ottoman Empire in the East and various European powers in the West. Now, again, the elongation of the space matters. There are no powerful natural borders anywhere between the Atlantic and uh, the, the tribal areas of Pakistan and Baluchistan. That's a very, very elongated space. So it's, by definition, very difficult for any one power to uh, uh, assume some kind of monopoly position within that space. China, of course, China on the other hand, most of the people are, is much more tightly uh, circumscribed. It's a much more compact area with much shorter uh, borders uh, than the outside world uh, due to uh, the amount of space. Next one, please. Uh, this uh, illustrates this principle uh, a bit more forcefully. We can see just how geographically circumscribed uh, core China is. You have Tibet and all kinds of really massive mountain ranges out uh, in the west. You have the steppe in the north. You have the Pacific Ocean to the east, or frankly, prior to Japan's industrialization in the late 19th century, not all that much uh, is going on. And you have a rural periphery to the south, but again, it's just basically the subtropical areas uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. So in a way, China is uh, it's, it's framed in a certain way uh, by geography that makes all the things be equal, which they are. I just talked about all the ways in which conditions are not equal, in which there are other forces in East Asia that are more conducive to imperial restoration. But even if all other things had to be equal, this geographical circumscription alone would logically make it easier for mid-sized powers to take over this entire territory. Yeah.